Hi, this is Kurt Hofer with the European Conservative, and I'm here interviewing Patrick Deneen, a professor at Notre Dame University, about his latest book, uh, Regime Change, which just came out. And in my bookstore in Los Angeles, I can say that it was it was slightly below the top of the shelf, which I think was not uh, was not an accident. But we can come back to that later. Um, so I'm here to discuss your book with you, and I'm, I'm I must say that I really enjoyed it. Um, I must say that uh, your last book, Why Liberalism Failed, was really, a, in my view, what was sort of a paradigm shift moment in uh, conservative thinking. And I think I think that this book as well continues in that vein. And my first question for you is, who did you write this book for? Was it written for an American audience? Was it written for um, our European uh, readers and listeners? That was one thing I kept wondering about as I read this book. Who who is your who is your target reader? Well, Kurt, thanks first for having me on and to invite me to talk about the book and for the kind words about the book. Uh, I, we were just mentioning before we started recording that this is among the first of my conversations about the book. So it's it's um, having now spent about four, four or five years talking about the last book, it's, it's fresh for me uh, to talk yeah. about um, a, a topic that continues the themes that I explored in that book, but tries to do so. Um, with uh, you know some kind of a constructive project in mind, as well as a the kind of continuing critique of liberalism. As to your question, um, in some ways, I'm I'm a little bit surprised because I, my suspicion, um, already confirmed by a few of the early reviews, is that the critique will be more that there's not enough um, there's not enough um, about America in some ways about in the book, or I'll put it this way that there's not enough drawn from kind of the American political theoretical tradition. So. On the one hand, many of the kind of examples and the, you know, the 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 specific kinds of events or topics that I draw on are very much drawn from, I think, largely, if not almost exclusively, American phenomena, college campuses, um, you know, American politics, American publications, and so forth. But much of the, I would say, the kind of theoretical apparatus is actually really pretty strongly based in, uh, you know, more broadly, a kind of European conservative uh, and European political intellectual tradition. And that ranges all the way back to Aristotle and Aquinas and Polybius, uh, as well as touching on such thinkers, you know, maybe more familiar thinkers to conservatives, certainly European conservatives like um, Edmund Burke or um, Disraeli. Um, or Alexis de Tocqueville, and yes. so this book doesn't this book doesn't have a lot of you know discussion of the Federalist a, a bit of the Federalist Papers and so forth, but it is more um, drawing on I think a, what we might think of as the kind of European either Anglo or Anglo European continental tradition. So, did you um, was that was that a conscious choice to stick to the more as you said Anglo European tradition, and what would you say to maybe American critics who would say that this book isn't American enough to be applicable to American conservatism, for instance. Well, yeah. So it was conscious in the sense that I'm I'm trying to draw on a, just to, for those who haven't read the book, what I'm really trying to do in the book is to reconnect in some ways conservatism to a very old, a very ancient tradition, which is you know called mixed constitution or mixed regime theory, which is really where the title of the book comes from. It's a, obviously a triggering title, and a, uh, you know I think a lot of people expect me to you know call for pitchforks and the overthrow of the government, but it's really about thinking about the nature of constitutions more broadly, not not just in the narrowest sense, but in the broadest sense, and in particular. The relationship of um, what in the beginning with ancient thinkers as far back as Aristotle, um, Polybius, and so forth, what they describe as the two as the fundamental division of any political society, which is the sort of the two parties: the party of the many and the party of the few. Uh, and it's striking, and I teach these I teach these texts all the time, and it's just striking to me how relevant and current, you know, reading you know, book four of Aristotle's politics has been in recent years where he speaks of the need to kind of think about how to reconcile or at some at some level to, to reach a kind of um, a, a settlement, a peaceful settlement among these otherwise deeply divided and deeply antithetical elements of any political society. Uh, and the fear is that if one doesn't reconcile or bring to kind of a peaceful resolution, these antagonisms 
the almost inevitable result is either civil war um, or a kind of anarchy, a kind of uh, the breakdown of authority uh, and the breakdown of political order. And, and I think, you know, we, we sort of see signs of both of those things in our politics today. So in, in some ways, it's the it's a it's drawing on a European slash Anglo tradition, but it's one that informed, you know, one that has informed and has been a part of the American tradition, at least insofar as America is in, in many ways a kind of uh, was the you know, the place where many immigrants from those from those places and those traditions came. And so it's it's trying in some ways to broaden out what we often think of as the conservative tradition, which has become extremely narrowly, you know, I, in my argument in the book, this book and the last book, narrowly focused on a kind of, you know, one strand of liberal thinking, which has kind of come to be thought of as the, the conservative tradition. So So it's really just an effort to really reclaim something that is rightfully ours. Great. I um so that well so you talked about the 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 many and the few. And uh one thing that I wanna I wanted to kind of follow up on about the many and the few. First off, some some people might think that you are going to explicitly denounce all and every kind of elite as a conservative. And I think that's, you make the case that that's actually not what you're arguing for. You're arguing for in your book for a uh, reformed elite, an elite that is oriented towards the common good. Um, but one of the one of the observations you made that really interested me from your book was you said that um, there's always been this, uh, not just this antagonism between the many and the few, but that even in modern liberal democracies, the uh, these 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 projects, these political projects, feared the many. So even the French, you know, or the American Revolution, there was an inherent fear of the the demos, as you say. There was a fear of of the masses, and I just to me that was so counterintuitive because I always thought of modern democracy as kind of. Uh, instantiating the power of the people. So could you could you explain that to us a little bit about what that sort of fear of the many or desire to restrain the many and the provincials, so to speak, is all about? Yeah. So um so part part of the part of the book is an effort to kind of re connect a genealogy of ideas, um, and in particular to point out the ways that the liberal tradition from the very beginning, um, and I mean the liberal tradition in the broadest sense, of course, um, you know, which includes cl the classical liberal tradition that we would associate with thinkers like John Locke or the Founding Fathers, as well as the progressive liberal tradition, which we would associate with thinkers like Rousseau or Marx or Hegel, um, or in the American context, John Dewey, and so forth, that the liberal project as a whole has been a distinctive kind of elite project and it's would in it with all of its internal divisions it sought to elevate a particular kind of elite in the kind of leadership positions and in the ruling positions of the liberal order uh and the the this effort was undertaken primarily to thwart the fears uh, among this rising new ruling class of the liberal order, the fears that the, the populace, the many, the demos, would, would be an obstacle to the aims uh, of these various iterations of the liberal project. And in the in the course of the book, I lay out um, you know, kind of almost a kind of schematic of what what this what this looks like. Um, but in but to be very brief about it, the classical liberal tradition really does in some ways on the one hand, it gets its start by with an explicit critique of the old elite, of the old aristocracy, and the effort to overthrow the old aristocracy, right, in the in the form of inherited status and rank, and again the old aristocratic markers of of position. But at the same time, it's also equally conscious and fearful of the way in which a kind of now liberated or unrestrained demos represents and constitutes a real threat to the order that is intended to replace the old aristocratic order. And this especially has to do with concerns over the priority of property and property rights. And, you know, this is, you know, this is an old story, right? The, the demos is going to be uh, resentful toward, um, you know, income inequality, we would say today, uh, resentful toward the material and economic inequalities that especially begin to accelerate in an 
open market capitalist, you know, the incipient capitalist order. How does one then set up um, set up a political order that on the one hand gains its legitimacy from claims of popular consent while restricting the actual ability and likelihood of the demos to interfere with this market order. And I think that's, in some ways, that's the kind of question you could say, that's the puzzle that early liberal thinkers are attempting to figure out. How to create a system that, you know, apparently at least has the the uh, uh, um, um, the basis of popular consent. And of course, that goes back to social contract theories. While also attempting to restrain the ways in which popular sentiments might overwhelm the primary effort to institute and instantiate a dynamic market order. And again, you can go back to passages in John Locke's second treatise, especially his book five, which is a discussion of property, and the real effort to begin to create, you know, the 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 order, the liberal order that that puts outside of the realm of popular opinion questions about property and property rights and contracts and really sees these now as protected judicially and legally as sort of outside of the political sphere, right? These are these are questions that will be dealt with um, at the level of, you know, sort of protections of individual rights and not as questions of, of political ordering and economic uh, economic ordering that's subject to political pressure and um, uh, and outcomes. So the the continuity with the progressive liberal tradition, which follows the classical liberal tradition, is it continues to be the desire to unleash the dynamism of that the liberal order is really designed to unleash economic dynamism, but really begins to see this dynamism as especially instantiated in the social domain, in the domain where there were a lot of customs and traditions and folk ways and you know expectations of how one would behave. And you know, if we think today about the kind of the rolling ongoing revolution in the kind of sexual domain and the domain of human relationships of what it is to be a man and a woman, we can see how that part of the progressive project manifests itself in this ongoing constant revolution. And the fear here is that the demos, the many, are this kind of conservative break and obstacle to this revolutionary, um, and constantly transformative um, undertaking. So in both of its guises, its classical and its progressive form, you have um, the kind of the, the the leaders and the designers of the liberal project seeking on the one hand to sort of use the imprimatur of popular consent as a legitimating tool while also restricting and restraining the ways in which the demotic um, uh, and sort of popular views, which would often be oriented to both exercising restraint on the open, often you know, kind of disruptive market forces, as well as a restraining force on those kind of revolutionary forces in the social domain. And so you have this kind of this fear in among liberal elites, uh, elites of this kind of conservative and um, you could say sort of anchor this anchoring tendency, this tendency to want to be anchored and to have stability and order. And that's you, a kind of a, that's kind of a part of this demotic, um, you could say, makeup of this of the of the kind of perspective of the ordinary kind of average person that has to be in some ways that has to be restrained, that has to be uh, forestalled. And I, I think that that is um, a very um, interesting. It's a unique, unique insight that you've made in this book. Uh, that there are attempts to limit not just reactionaries, not just, you know, uh, uh, quote unquote, papist movements or whatever you'd want to call it, but there are restraints on popular sovereignty in many respects. And what one thing I want to ask is because in, in at least my generation growing up, the, the conservative movement is so deeply ingrained with free market uh free market principles what would you say again to critics of this book whether in america or in europe and i could see critics from both um, sides of the atlantic making this argument that when you uh critique uh property uh rights or unrestrained economic growth and technological innovation when you critique in, in essence aspects or excesses of the free market 
Um, what would you say to critics who are saying that, you know, you, Professor Deneen, are essentially a, a Luddite. You are trying to stop economic growth uh, and innovation, and this common good conservatism is going to be a, uh, a disaster for, for the economies of Europe and the West if imp implemented. What would you say to a critique like that? Well, and I, that critique is often, as, you, as you're well aware, that critique is often made. Uh, I guess I, I would say a couple of things. So first of all, um, it's not that I'm uh, that I'm a critique of that I'm critic of, you know, changes or economic growth or um, various forms of um, innovation and so forth. But um, it does seem to me that the that to simply regard any of those developments as a kind of inevitable, un you know irresistible um, set of developments that arise from kind of forces that are beyond human control is a kind of oddly and curiously paradoxical admission of human powerlessness and the absence of actual human freedom, the absence of actual human freedom to deliberate and to assess and to question whether or not certain kinds of developments, certain kinds of efforts to extract money from people are actually good for um, the flourishing of human society. And so one area where we see, I think, increasing pushback on these questions is in the area of the implementation and, and sort of the expansion of um, you know, access to pornography, access to just you know social media and so forth among the very young, uh, the effect that it's having on a generation that's not really quite measurable and quite visible. And I think a growing number of people across the political aisle, left and right alike, now are beginning to say, you know what, maybe this experiment wasn't good. And to simply say market forces should simply be able to do what they do, uh, attempting to extract as much money, get as many eyeballs, uh, do do what's necessary and possible to um, increase um, expenditures and outlays and so forth. That this is um, this is not this is not objectively good. That there are ways in which we can say certain forms of um, human development require uh, restraints upon certain actions what we might regard as the the liberties of individuals to do as they will. And in these domains, it seems to me, we're, we're beginning to see, I think, a kind of pushback against that. And of course, we've seen pushback against this as well uh, in the domains of immigration. We've seen pushback against this in questions about whether or not there needs to be you know, more focus on national markets and national productivity and certain kinds of um, you know, industries that are essential for national security. All of these are questions that if one leaves them to the market, one doesn't uh, adequately address concerns of the common good, the national common good, the common good uh, of those who are citizens of the country, those especially who might be at the economic margins of the country. So I, so it seems to me that a conservative has to be able to add, you know, in some ways to have, you know, be able to hold various ideas in their mind that, that a market is a good tool. And I don't deny that. And I want to suggest I'm just a Marxist who wants to eliminate mar uh, markets. This is just, you know, this is just a, a kind of silly talking point. Um, I, I think markets are a very valuable and useful and necessary tool. But like any tool, it has its uses. And when that, when those uses exceed or go beyond what those, the goods that those uses, um, uh, uh, or the good that that tool can can achieve. Um, then one has, you know, one has sort of exaggerated the usefulness or the the applicability of that tool. So it seems to me that a conservative has is called upon, uh, and indeed, it's a, it, I think it's a distinctive aspect of conservative to exercise prudential judgment, uh, the necessary view of what are the limits of a particular, you know, form of social organization or particular tool that we might have, uh, and to assess that in a way that is, um, you know, uh, conscious of and and aware of the. The needs and and demands of the common good. I I have to say that when you bring up the term the common good for for me it's it's really not as problematic as some of your critics uh, have have argued because it, it it brings me back to I I heard you speak in uh, uh, Franciscan University in Steubenville and I and I spoke with Rusty Reno and some others and I've now read some of the works of your fellow uh, post liberals who are doing very interesting things. And 
what, what Rusty Reno said to me is he said, we've been trying the same thing for the last 40 years. And common good conservatism, I think, is an acknowledgement of, like you said, some excesses of market forces and simply of the need to try something new. There is, you know, insanity is uh, trying the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, right? Right. Um, the, and so, and yeah, I, I was going to say the funny thing is that um, it's also it's also the effort to try something old in a way. <laughs> Yes, and that's but in an important way, in an important respect, it's not. Um, and I think again, often when uh, I'll encounter the accusation, you just want us to go back to the Middle Ages or whatever. Pick your, pick your time in antiquity or some, you know, nineteen fifties or some inconceivable time period. Um, really, what I think any you know a conservative, um, someone worthy of that of that uh, description, is always conscious of the the resources that are available in our past in our history in our in the philosophy and that's my particular area of focus political philosophy always to be um, re re-engaging rediscovering um, reading anew attempting to uh, understand a new very what are very old lessons there are very few things in the world that are genuinely new uh you know a lot an awful lot of great people have lived in the world and have thought a lot of great thoughts. And so simply to spend a fair amount of one's time reading older thinkers, you can discover a lot of really great things that you, you, you know, that, that civilization itself has forgotten. Uh, but that, that's not to say that it's simply a matter of taking some old idea and saying, okay, we're just going to apply this. You have to, you have to think about how those old ideas, those ancient, often ancient ideas apply to contemporary times. And that's really the the you know as I've already mentioned the one of the main efforts of the book was to rethink and to try to reimagine this this um, this very ancient idea of the mixed constitution for a more contemporary time where the problems that are described by the likes of Aristotle, Polybius, Aquinas, Machiavelli, and so forth those problems seem to me to be absolutely contemporary, but how we refashion and rethink them is is really that's a kind of that's a a question of kind of political art as opposed to some kind of let's just do what Aristotle says we should do. Right. So there has to be a nuanced reapplication of these ideas. Um, you know, you you mentioned again the the mixed constitution idea, which is so critical in your book. So I think maybe we should brief, briefly break down that idea and kind of relate it to the present, which is uh, for our listeners, for our viewers, I want to just point out that uh, Professor Deneen's book does not say we are going to overthrow the elites. We are going to create a new populist government that will start from scratch. Can you explain to me your very, very uh, I would say, nuanced and actually quite subtle conception of the mixed constitution and the role that the, you know, Frankly, the elites, for lack of a better word, will will play in it. Yeah. Well, I guess one place to begin. I mean, it's a it's a big question that we could spend a good deal amount of time on. But but um, one place to begin is is a kind of almost a kind of compilation of of many of the thinkers I just mentioned, and I, I would also include in that number figures like Tocqueville as well, who um, it seems to me describe these two parties, these two kind of elements in any political society as having both inherent, or let's say potential, the potential for realizing certain inherent vices and the potential for realizing certain inherent virtues, that, that it can go either way. That, that in, other ways, in other words, like any human being, we all have these kind of gifts and these possibilities. And if you're raised well, they might, you know, you might turn out to be a great pianist or a great college professor or, you know, a great skier or whatever it is. Um, but if certain things don't happen, then you may become a criminal. You may end up in the prison system. So, you know, that in other words, that we all have these, these possibilities within us. And it, what's striking about these classical thinkers, even into more contemporary times, into the modern times, is that they recognize these inherent features that that attach themselves to to these 
elements of society, these basic, this the, the kind of the two parties of society, what what Machiavelli describes as the two humors uh, of of any political order. The the elites, um, on the one hand, have a tendency to certain kinds of vices that we're well familiar with. They are they tend to have power. They tend to have access to the tools of power. They will therefore tend to use them to their own advantage and um, uh, often to the point of suppression of the other party, the party of the many. They will often regard themselves as, you know, with the kind of self-congratulation that they've earned their status, that, you know, they are the the beneficiaries of God's blessing and anyone outside of their circle is, uh, you know, deserves their their position and their status. Spend some time at Harvard and you might get a little bit of that. Um, uh uh, and and um, as well, to, you know, kind of separate themselves from the unwashed masses, you know, literally either in palaces or today in kind of, you know, the the nice places on the East Coast where they tend to live and don't have to see the backward gun toting Neanderthals of the of my part of the country. Uh, the the many also have certain kinds of tendencies to, to vices, which is that. They can be coarse, right? They are not elevated. They're often not well educated. They are, um, they can be parochial uh, to the point of being xenophobic and um, uh, um, ignorant, uh, uncurious, uh, closed. Uh, they can be uh, coarse in the sense of, you know, just kind of, um, you know, not cultivated, uh, not having a kind of, you know, more elevated kinds of, of culture. On the other hand, as we might begin to begin to paint a composite picture, the the sort of potential for inherent virtues um, of each of these parties are also really quite distinctive, and and it seems to me uh, um, both praiseworthy. Uh, elites, uh, because they often have access to education and leisure, will often be more cultivated and cultured. They will develop the kinds of high culture that we rightly praise. And I'm sure the European conservative rightly praises these. Obviously, the great art, the great music, the great uh, uh, architect, you know, the architectural achievements of the Western tradition, uh, things that we regard as the great inheritances of the West are, to a significant extent, the the result of efforts of elites, to, often to build monuments to themselves, but also monuments to civilization. Uh, they have, um, because of their leisure, again, they have... Um, you know, kind of ability to, to to think, to reflect, to produce works of, uh, or to in, uh, or to support people who produce works of reflection of philosophic and literary achievement. Um, so this is, you know, no civilization can be ultimately a good civilization without this kind of elite. Uh, at the same time, ordinary people also have inherent kinds of virtues that can be developed or are likely to develop, which is the nearness to the earth. Um, the nearness to the stuff of life, uh, the kind of understanding that's almost as part of one's fingertips of how the world works, of having the ability to sort of work with the stuff of the world, to fix things, to know how to do things. Like any of us who are in this, you know, in the professorial world, when we when we're around somebody who can like, you know, repair electrical, you know, outlets and build buildings, you know, it's a, it's a thing of, of that that you have to admire, like, but that the, the, somebody can do this with such ease um, and such knowledge. Um, they are often people who are more likely to be appreciative of um, the world that offered to them. And and if you begin if you begin to hear a little bit of Wendell Berry esque praise of the. Sort of the ordinary yeoman farmer, or the or the the per person who works with their hands. I think that's that's part of those virtues. So here's the question: How does one build a society that develops the latter while avoiding the former? And that 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 to me is a good mixed regime. That to me is a good mixed constitution. That and it seems to me that 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 in other words that has the kinds of elites I described as having is as having those kinds of virtues. And that a, mutual, has a mutual strengthening of the virtues of, that's right. of both that's right. the elites and that's right. And the, the demos, the many. And, and the demos and the many. And those who, you know, who who you know work in the more ordinary parts of the world and parts of life. And what's what I find brilliant and heartening about this tradition that I'm mentioning is that 
there's been a consistent theme in this in this line of thinking that the the one can only the the one side can only be in some in some ways improved by the the benefits and the virtues of the other side that each in some ways can mutually improve the other the danger is that when they act on their own kind of their worst inclinations they make each other worse and so this is where I began the book. I really began the book by thinking, you know what? I, I find myself not really being able to side in a full-throated way with either the elites or the populists. If we want to sort of break down the great divide of the Western liberal order today, it does seem to be increasingly a kind of populist versus a kind of more liberal elite divide. And I find myself in some ways saying, you know, can't we actually have sort of good elites and good demos? Can't we actually have... Uh, why do we have to choose in some ways between two parties that seem to me to be, you know, sort of have have deep, you know, deep kinds of uh, pathologies uh, that um, are in some ways mutually reinforcing the path, the most pathological aspects of, of each side. And that was really the beginning point and where I wanted to reconnect with this, uh, with this more ancient tradition and bring it in some ways up to date. So, um, you, you mentioned the pathologies on both sides. So you have plenty of criticism for both the political left and the political right. Uh, one thing I want to, I do want to say about, about your book and your ideas is I, I, I do not see, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not see them being well received by what I would call the mainstream media. Um, These which, ideas? We, sorry. My my arguments, your arguments, yes. Oh well, yeah, no. I mean, that that was built in because so, I'm I'm criticizing those who are in the <laughs> on both the left and the right, those who are in some ways the ruling, the ruling element today. But I I do I do see that you know your your book, and I'm not going to get into names here, but has been has been I would say caricatured um, by certain people, and which leaves me to wonder, how do you see a common good conservatism emerging, or where do you see it emerging already, perhaps, uh, particularly in a media landscape that I would argue is is fairly hostile to your ideas. Yeah, yeah no, I mean it's been it's it is no in no way surprising the kind of the wall of uh, the wall of criticism that the book has been met with, and that's you know again that's entirely to be expected because I'm criticizing the ruling class on both the left and the right. So the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, for instance, both, you know, I think on the same day, you know, engaged in in strike in some ways similar, if but in, in other ways different, but nevertheless, both kind of just kind of a... I didn't name names, but you did. Yes. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, it, but, it, but I mean, that would have been, it would have been, it would have shocked me if it hadn't, if, if it had been otherwise. Um, yes. So what is it, so what is it for in some ways? Well, I, on the one hand, of course, you're right. You know, we do have this media landscape that is dominated um, by the progressive liberals on the one hand, uh, and then certainly with the mainstream newspapers, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and so forth. And the right, uh, its media outposts are dominated by right liberals, uh, what are sometimes called conservatives, but really are really just just kind of updated versions of classical liberals that are that I equally criticize in this book. And they have a lot of they have a lot of platforms, and there's been you know it seems to me a very concerted effort to make sure you know sort of warn people don't read this book. This is you know this is you know this is you know. the wagons. There's been a the lot wagons of, of the elites have been circled. Yes, they, they've sure. circled. I mean, it's, it's amazing the amount of ink that's been spilled to say don't read this book. It's not you know it has nothing to say. So it's uh, uh it does seem at some level. Um, you know, amusing at some level, but you know, I, you're right that the question of sort of who would read this in given the sort of wall of opposition, we're all you know we exist today in a in a media landscape in which those platforms don't control what gets said, and those platforms don't uh, don't determine what ideas are are permitted to be in circulation. They certainly try to limit the ideas that are permitted in circulation. But they're not able to do so in the way in which they might have been, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, and certainly 50 years ago, in which it was a very strict line of what was permitted. Uh, and in some ways, you know, we are we are in this kind of new situation where, you know, even this program which we're discussing, this is just one of the, those spaces where 
we can have a discussion and we can actually talk about the ideas in this book and these ideas that I think are of interest to people uh, um, who understand and I think intuit there's something really deeply wrong with the arrangement, the political arrangements in the Western world today, certainly in America, Britain, across Europe. And as you just said, as you, you just said, to simply want to continue to do the same thing is really literally the the definition of insanity. And so I, I, I think it will probably take a little while to find um, the audience that will have to go through these alternate media routes um, that, that uh, uh, that right now you could say the the wagons having circled are desperate to prevent these kinds of discussions and these kinds of debates. But um, I would say that the the dominant the dominant kind of interaction that I have today is not with these you could say sort of mainstream media types. It's with young people. It's with students. Uh, the the event I did in Washington D.C. to launch the book had about 400 people, and almost all of them were basically the age of my students, sort of late teens, early 20s to mid to late 20s, and they are just not buying what's being sold by the old platforms. They just aren't buying it. They don't believe that the answer is simply let's return to 1990. Uh, that that the answer lies with you know Ronald Reagan versus Bill Clinton or something. That the that these old answers have have been exhausted and shown themselves not to have uh, the answers for a set of problems that we face uniquely today. So I so I in some ways I I actually take some comfort in the fact uh, that the re the reception has been as I expected because when the regime feels threatened it will do exactly what it has been doing. Well, that to me is fascinating that you're finding such a receptive. Uh younger audience uh, for your for your work as well, particularly given that um, they have not necessarily seen uh, firsthand or or remembered some of the more recent what I would characterize as as disasters of our ruling class. Yeah, yeah although they're living amid the wreckage. so they're, I think, yeah, they're living yeah. amidst the ruins for sure. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to ask you just one one last question in the guise of the ruling class here, because I find it, um, you mentioned the New York Times and you mentioned the Wall Street Journal. I saw an interview uh, with, with Mike Pence in the Wall Street Journal. It sounded just to me amazingly like something you would have heard in 2004, 2008, just in terms of the ideas, uh, the sort of uh, what I would call foreign adventurism, um, the, the uh, beholdenness to free market, what I would call free market fundamentalism. But I, I, I want to say, what would you say to the to the elite outlets who who argue that your vision of a common good conservatism with, um, you know, uh, protections for national economies with with uh, pro natalist policies, encouraging childbirth, you know, do some some uh, people in your post liberal circle have talked about making childbirth free, for instance. Um, what would you say to those classical liberals who who argue, um, sometimes dis disingenuously, but not always, that we don't have the money? Western democracies don't have the money for a more robust uh, welfare state. That we're we're going bankrupt. We just can't. We just can't do this. Uh, what What would you say to them? You know, it's funny how you would introduce the topic because you. You rightly mentioned that at the same time you get these claims that we're broke, you also have this, you know, renewed calls to what you called foreign adventurism, you know, kind of limitless purse when it comes to um, what's called often called defense, uh, but which is not often about really about defense. It's about kind of managing and governing the global order. So we have limitless purse when it comes to you know weaponry and so forth, and then we are broke when it comes to such things as whether or not we're going to support people forming families. And you know, at some level, well, what is what is all the expenditure of defense for, if we're not going to perpetuate ourselves as a civilization? Right? What, what? So the basic question seems to me is what are our priorities? And yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly in favor of defending our nation, and any nation should be. You know, as a primary duty should be um, you know concerned with and dedicated to its defense. But we're talking about something rather different when it comes to I think we're speaking here um, 
not sure if you're speaking primarily about the United States, but in the case of the United States, um, we spend an awful lot of money on a lot of things, um, which we no longer really have to justify, or at least are not justified um, by the political class. I mean, we could we could look at the expenditure of you know how much we've spent on the defense of Ukraine. Now, whether or not one supports that or not, this was never really a topic of discussion. Uh, this was never really a topic of widespread political national debate. There was no suggestion that we lacked the money. We lacked the funding to send billions upon billions of dollars uh, to uh, assist the defense of the Ukraine. And yet when it comes to such things as whether or not uh, we'll support families struggling to be able uh, to bring children into the world and to raise them, well, suddenly then we have no money. So I, I simply just do not believe or nor trust nor credit these kinds of arguments um, when we have these kinds of claims on the one hand that we we need to have spend limit, limitlessly in this one domain, uh, and yet we have no funds in the other domain. It seems to me that we what we are really faced with is a set a deeper set of assumptions about what is what constitutes a good society, what constitutes a good and flourishing society, and that's it's at that level where I think. Once we begin to see there are certain things that we prioritize as a civilization at the expense of other things, well, then we can have an honest debate about what that looks like. But to begin the debate by saying we have no money is really is it seems to me a kind of false claim that's designed to shut down any any further debate. Do you think, uh, just to bring it back to Europe, do you think that the European nations could be doing more uh, to promote family formation? And do those nations have the money? to promote family formation when we hear the claims that they're not contributing enough to their own uh, defense budgets, for instance. Well, sure. I mean, and, and you know, I mean, the the example that's that's rightly often offered uh, is that of Hungary, which um, it seems to me of all the European nations today has done the most and is attempting to do the most in terms of family policy. And while the while, you know, it sh should certainly be acknowledged that Hungary has not achieved um, plus, you know, positive replacement rates in terms of, um, you know, the, the numbers of children being born. What it has shown is that through a kind of exerted effort to be creative in its in the policy domain to really just, you know, everything from obviously, you know, I mean, families with four children, the women no longer, mothers no longer have to pay any income taxes for the rest of their lives. I think I think I'm right about that. Yes. Uh, there's all kinds of various incentives that help people get, be able to buy a house, uh, be able to uh, afford the kinds of things you need to be able to uh, to be able to buy and to, and, and to purchase when you are uh, when you have a larger family. Uh, even the assistance of the government to encourage businesses to have family um, you know, family fees and family uh, um, rates for you know for, for in private enterprise, just using the kind of the the power of the public order to say it's a very good thing. We would laud you. You will your name will be praised. Uh, your business will be put on a list of family po you know family favored uh, and family positive uh, businesses. Uh, these kinds of things. Uh, um, once they reach a kind of cumulative level, what we've seen is the actual reversal of the decline of birth rates in the country of in the country of Hungary. Now they're also spending money; they're spending six percent of their GDP for these policies. That's way more. That's a lot more than the United States or I think any Western country is spending uh, on family policy. But it seems to me, unless you have a kind of combination of the willingness to to devote some percentage, some significant percentage, six percent in this case, it's a lot less than we we, we devote to our military, uh, but but a significant amount to um, supporting families, uh, as well as really just being willing to explore different kinds of policy options. And here it seems to me in the United States, again to go back to a, a theme of conservatives from from yesteryear, you know we have fifty laboratories, we have we have a lot of different. Um, ways in which we can experiment with policies and see what works and what doesn't work. Um, so, I, so as well as, of course, uh, attempting to do this at the, at, the, at the national level, at the scale of the national level. Uh, but it seems to me that, uh, that if we're going to say that this is a country we're proud of, that we believe in, that we think has a future, that we think needs to be defended and defended even unto death, that if we're not 
a civilization that is producing the next generation and supporting the fostering and bringing up of the next generation, then all that rhetoric is really just empty. I think we're going to end there, Professor Deneen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for uh, discussing your book with us. And I wish you the best on your nascent book tour and speaking tour. Thanks very much, Kurt. Thanks for having me.